day. This was day one on the Lifetime Project. It's hard to describe just how beautiful this climb is. And how hard and scary. And we're on top rope. Look at where it is too. I really want to do this one day in the future. I don't know when, it might be years from now, a decade, decades, I don't know, but. Wow. <laughs> one day. Now I've got the fear out. A really cool, big, intimidating 50 meter trad route. <laughs> It's a, a line that you can't really walk away from once you've tried it. You are ready. Ready for this butte right here. Ooh, mama. About 10 years ago, I climbed once upon a time in the Southwest. And at the time, I was the first uh, woman to do that route and also the first woman to climb the UK grade of E9. I got the second female incentive once upon a time and it was really nice to be trying it with Madeline Cope who climbed it the day after me. It was my first E9. It's a sort of really sheer wall that when you stand at the bottom of it, it's like it just looks like it goes on forever. When you actually stand onto the route, all those holds are like facing the wrong way, um, which is what adds to its really like insecure and sort of technical nature. Didn't know whether I was going to be capable of climbing this route. I'd seen the video of Hazel Finley climbing it and it looked terrifying. But there is something slightly different about British trad routes. I remember feeling really excited to get on the route and really intimidated by the route and quite scared by it. The e-grading system is something that's kind of complicated, don't really understand it half the time myself. I think I might even get it wrong if I try to describe what it's all about. So I am somewhat practiced at describing this e-system. The e-system describes the overall experience of the climb, so it takes into account things like how run out it is, how loose the rock is, how good the gear is, how intimidating it is, the general feel and atmosphere of a route can be included in the E grade. The route can be technically easy but maybe really bold so it gets a higher E grade or it can be really safe but technically hard and then it'll get a higher E grade. As you go higher up those E grades, sort of historically it's been more scary. The bit after it, like 6A, 5C, is not to be confused with the French grading system and labels the difficulty of the hardest move of the route. I knew next to nothing about the British E grade system. All I knew was that this is the most beautiful slab I'd ever seen and I had to get on it. Projecting routes at my limit has always been a really emotional process for me. So I figured it was fitting to break up my projecting process of Once Upon a Time into the different emotions I felt as I got closer and closer to the send. Day one, there was absolutely no pressure. I was excited for the opportunity to hang off a static line with Tom and play on my absolute favorite style of climbing, slab. We started chalking holds in the blank face and sequencing sections together. The rock on the sea cliff is quite finicky. So chossy. So on day two, Tom and I spent a bit of time cleaning the bottom section and discovering new holds on the crux sequences, only to break them off. Remember the, the public services, you have to clean a little bit more every time you're up there. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Okay. There you go. By the end of day three, I actually managed to link the climb from ground up on a shunt, albeit without gear placements, which was a wildly cool achievement for me. Pangs of excited nervousness paired with a huge wave of imposter syndrome replaced my carefree joy from the previous two days. I realized how unequipped and absurd it was for me to be there, attempting this world-class trad line while I had only led a few five nines on gear before. One in Indian Creek and a few more, plus some mixed harder climbs in Yosemite. This was also the day Hazel showed up at the crag alongside some other well-known trad climbers in the UK. I felt starstruck and like a total noob amongst legends in the sport. Is that it there? It just drops off. Yeah. At the sea cliff. Oh my God, so much acne. Earlier today, my boob got stuck in the gree gree because I was like so into the wall climbing. I'm like, oh, it's probably, I don't know if it's PC to show, but like. Day four, I went down the cliff with my friend Ian and we began sorting out gear for the climb. 
I was extremely stressed about the prospect of placing gear, seeing as this is the first time I was using the majority of these micro sizes. I'm at this phase where I have to start figuring out where to put gear in, and it's really daunting because I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing, I just don't feel so confident in that knowledge. So it'll be, a, I'll just go out on the route and try to play around and then see if Tom and Ian can help me. Information flooded my mind, not only of the actual sequences of this nearly 50 meter slab, <laughs> but of where to place the gear and how to place it. All right. <laughs> so I'm figuring out gear and there's this hilarious piece. So let's see if I can show you. So this is the first piece you get after the entire run out. Yeah, it's not just about like whether the gear will hold if you place it well, because we're on this like really fickle sea cliff and <laughs> everything pops off all the time. Like I swear the crux has changed like three times. I knew at this point that all I had left to do was to rehearse the route and hopefully complete a clean top rope ascent with gear placements. I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded by people who somehow believe in me and feel like I should, you know, have a go at this and deserve to try, even if this is absolutely ridiculous for someone who doesn't, hasn't really trad climbed. Maybe, maybe it'll just be fine. There were three obvious sections to this climb. The sustained crimp line, the crux, and the runnel. There were actually quite a few pieces of gear to place in the first section of the wall, making it much burlier than I had anticipated on the slab route. Basically, this section spans about 15 meters of full crimp lock-offs and suboptimal feet on hidden slots and smears. It's not super tricky, but it's physically sustained and beta intensive. The crux comes after a nice ledge where you can shake your feet out, apparently crucial when climbing long bouts of techie slab. Having my feet ready for the crux was essential to staying on the smears and not slipping right off. The sequence starts with switching my left hand to an undercling and standing up tall on two tiny feet. The right hand comes into a hold that looks much better than it is. Ian and I took to calling the slot the deceiver. From this position, I make a blind RP placement in the crack to my left. Uh, yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Reaching over to the side pole, I carefully lift my left foot to a smear so I can place my right foot below. My left foot reaches far across to a tiny crystal, and then I completely let go of my hands to double clutch the seam with two gastones. From here, I bump my right foot up to the smear and lock on a two finger crimp. My left hand goes to a crimp right next door, and I readjust my feet to span to a crimp out left. Then comes probably one of the more awkward pieces on the route, a red wild country point one, a bit more out of reach than you want it to be. It was like bending. After this sequence, I press into a mantle and get to a really nice resting position. This is where the last section of the climb begins. There is a bomber gear placement and then the runnel. It's basically a lot of sustained, beautiful, technical and balancing moves without any placements. Long spans, high feet, and bravery are key to executing the final 20 meters of the climb. It's proper British track climbing. This is what happens when you try to put in gear. Bugs everywhere. Tabs are dying. Okay, so this is not right. Uh, no. Towards the top of the runnel, gear placements appear, but hold quality goes down. At any moment, the rock could break, and it's actually quite terrifying trusting some of the crimps and nubbins. Feels like I've been climbing forever. <laughs> Half an hour feels like a long time up here, though. At the beginning of the seventh day, I realized that sending once upon a time could be a reality. I had a clean go on the shunt while placing gear that morning and felt on top of the world. Physically, I knew I had it in me. Nice. You're right. I think that's where I should stop. I know I can do this now. I know I can. I just have to. And I'm not even that scared of the crux anymore. I think I'm ready to do it. There's so many people here watching my first lead. I'm so scared. My confidence descended into terror as I realized the next step was leading and trusting my gear placements, something I had never tested before.
I took my first fall on gear that evening, although a bit scary in the moment, after the fall, I felt calm and collected. It wasn't actually so bad. Well, kind of like how I expected it to go. I felt at the beginning because I still, I still don't even have that part memorized. I didn't know how I should do the gear placement and I just totally fumbled, got it wrong. I know I wanted to rehearse it again before lead, but with the weather windows being so inconsistent, I thought I'd just go for it on lead, which I'm really glad I did because the fall was great. I placed my gear well. Everything was super chill, like a sport climb. Uh, but I'll have to come back and try it after rehearsing those moves a little bit more. This is the last trip I would be able to take before two critical impasses would occur. One, torrential downpours were forecasted for the foreseeable future, and two, I was leaving the country. Today is the last chance I get to try to climb, and it was raining all day yesterday. It was raining even a little bit this morning, but as you can see, the skies are pretty blue. I'd come to accept that I likely wouldn't send the dream slab in time. Instead, I tried to focus on how incredible the experience had been for me. I learned so much about gear, rope management, and of course, my own physical and mental limits. Of course I was nervous. Although I didn't think I was going to send, I sure as hell was gonna give it 100%. I knew a few things going in. There was no time to mess up, there was no time to be scared, and there would be no other chance this year to go for it again. I didn't know whether I would be able to do it, so... At the end of it, I was pretty happy to walk away, having not fallen off it on the lead. That excitement, those positive emotions kind of overruled any kind of negative emotions that I had. That moment that you choose to take the top rope away and set off from the ground, you just have a lot of confidence in yourself and in sort of your ability and your ability to like judge the situation. Um, and I think that that's a really valuable lesson. On this, our last day, Tom and I were perfectly in tune with each other. Both of us completely flubbed the start sequence for our first attempts. We then revved up for our second leads of the day, each of us getting higher than our last attempt and falling around the crux sequence. On Tom's third go of the day, he looked so graceful and confident and just smooth on the wall. He sang kings and queens all the way through the crux and to the top out. It was honestly an honor to have been playing, scoring the blue point for such a queen line. Had a boom! Oh, that was so much fun. Yeah? Oh, I loved it. <laughs> I was just singing away to myself the whole way up. Oh, like literally, that's the most fun I've had climbing in like 10 years on a bloody slab room. Oh, great. Who would have thought it? Oh, it's like just proper fun the entire way. Just in time as well, because it's spitting a bit. Then it began to rain for about five minutes. Tom kept putting the gear on my harness though, and reassured me that the route wouldn't be too wet after only a few minutes of rain. What came next was some of the most intense climbing of my life. I comically made what seems like every beginner trad climber mistake. I managed to knock off gear in crucial positions, cross my lines creating heavy rope drag, and fumble through nearly every piece.
Yes, Anna. Good effort. With your foot. Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely over. Yeah, over your ropes and over the gear and everything, yeah. Well done. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my yeah, a couple of pieces fell out. You had plenty of pieces in though. Yeah, well done. Really good. It's <laughs> such a good effort. I'm so not prepared for chat. I'm happy, I just look distraught. <laughs> I could tell you were full on focus there. Oh, thanks for thanks for being up there. That's alright. How did it? <laughs> yeah, good. It gave me the illusion of safety. I'm like, there are people here. It can't be so dangerous. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, Tom was himself. <laughs> Tom's like, if you fall and hurt yourself, this is on me. <laughs> I didn't know my mental game would be strong enough to do something this intense. Less than a year ago, I was crying out of fear on a friendly bolted 513A sport climb. I'm excited to continue embracing the chaotic, beautiful discomfort that climbing has to offer and definitely embark on some more sketchy and sexy slab projects. I really hope you liked that video. It took a lot of love and time and effort to make, and it wouldn't have been possible without my sponsors and my patrons for my Patreon. So if you do like my videos, first off, make sure to subscribe, like, comment, all of that. It all helps the algorithm. And secondly, go check out my Patreon because you can be a part of the journey, get exclusive access to everything, and, and I am partnering with my friend Zoe, who is making me these epic Slab is Sexy stickers for my channel. It's like my first merch. So go and check it out on Patreon. All right, I'll see y'all later. Bye. Yes! yes! <laughs>